So, precious God, we come tonight thanking you for your faithfulness, Lord, in all these weeks, the unfolding of your great apostolic and priestly heart to us, Lord. So merciful in the way that you've looked upon our frames and know that we are as dust, Lord. And to give it to us in installments and to bring us from where we were, my God, to where you would have us to be, to put before us heroic challenges, my God, monumental things. You are the, you're the Alpha and the Omega of these days. You gave this occasion, my God. No man sought it. You gave the beginning, and now we ask also that you'll give your conclusion. We look to you, my God, so grateful for the anointing that was alluded to tonight. For we know, my God, without that holy anointing oil poured out from the throne of God, everything is hay, wood, and stubble. Your anointing is your very life, my God, the essence of your being, that vibrant, life-giving and penetrating quality. It has nothing to do with deserving, my God, or having put sufficient time in, in prayer as to warrant it. It's a gracious gift unto the church, to men. And we ask it tonight, Lord, that your word might go forth to kindle something in our hearts and to melt them and to work a concluding work in these days. Be with my mouth now, by your spirit, and be with our hearing, our hearts, and our responses. And we'll thank you and give you the praise for all of your great faithfulness to us through these days and the days that are before us. For Jesus' sake, in his, in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I think this is the first in 12 weeks where I've come up with only a Bible and only one Bible, no supplementary reading material, no outline, nothing, just the Bible. I guess I was banking on a very small turnout tonight, and we would just kind of draw our chairs up in a little circle, and I would whisper intimate things. So um, maybe we'll still do that. I can't quite get away from uh, last week's theme, that in the last analysis, when the smoke clears, where all the great principles of the kingdom and all of the heady apostolic themes that God has been sounding, that in the last analysis, what it reduces itself to and what is at its heart is the personal relationship between the believer and his God. And that is the foundation, and that is the apostolic thing. And when we have lost that, then we're just marketing principles of the kingdom or... Um, um, government or divine order or some of the kinds of things that we think to have apostolically majored upon uh, it will be false it's not a uh, an agenda or a um, set of principles in which God would have us to be inducted but into whole mode and manner of being and thinking and and relating so I've been reading through the Gospels um, if I didn't share this with you, the Lord has kind of wrapped my knuckles somewhere in the course of these 12 weeks to show me that uh, I myself have been overlooking the true foundation. Paradoxically, speaking on, the, on, par on apostolic foundations of the, of the faith and neglecting it myself, for there's no other foundation that can be laid than G Christ Jesus. And it's not the principles or even the apostolic epistles as uh, precious as they are, it's the person of Jesus himself. And that my intense Jewish zeal uh, has kind, had kind of disguised and neglect of my relationship to the person of Jesus. And that as a matter of fact, there was something residual in my Jewishness uh, and in the, the monotheistic emphasis that we Jews have had that did not make sufficient room for him. And therefore, something was neglected for the want of that relationship in my own being, namely the humanity of God, God in the flesh, that would affect one's own humaneness. And the brothers who brought me this very precious insight and word also commended to me that I needed to major on the Gospels and not leap over it as if it's kid stuff, preliminary, and that the heavy weight stuff uh, are the apostolic writings. So I have been devotionally reading the Gospels every morning and every evening uh, through these weeks and being reintroduced to Jesus and uh, finding precious things 
in the Gospels that I had not seen it uh, in previous readings. And I want to begin tonight with uh, just where I presently am in the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 14. And the Gospel of John, I don't have a word. I mean, wow. It is... Well, it was in the Gospel of John that the Lord gave me that initial revelation 23 years ago aboard the a deck of a trans steamer en route to Greece, which was my spiritual homeland, Jew by birth, Greek by conviction. The, the humanist, the philosophical nut going to the land of uh, Plato and, and Aristotle and Socrates. And rightly, on that journey from Italy to Greece, the Greek book, the New Testament, came into my hands for the first time, never willing to have opened it in times past so arrogantly contemptuous of any one book that could be purported to be the answer but now I was ready through the dealings of God and through a life that had come to its own unhappy and pathetic conclusion as a headstrong self-willed self-righteous uh, Jewish man and in the very first reading in the Gospel of John in the episode of the woman taken in the act of adultery in the one statement out of the lips of Jesus, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. That sentence came up off the page, penetrated my eyes, my brain, my whole body began violently to tremble, and instead of stopping and lodging in my mind, which I thought is the seat of life, the false altar, it went down into my heart like a shot to a disorder and cleaved me in two, and I was just left a trembling hulk on the boat, the deck of that ship. In a moment of time, with the absolute certitude in that moment that there's a living God, I'm reading his book, and Jesus says who he claims to be. So you can understand why I have a special endearment for the Word of God and for the Gospel of John in particular. And it's inexhaustible, as is true of all the Scripture, to keep uh, drawing the enormous riches and, and even to go beyond the meat and to suck the marrow out of the bone. You'll never come to the end of it. Sweetest, most nutritious part is the marrow. And uh, maybe we who have been content with meat have moved from milk to meat, thought that that was the end of the line. But I want to commend to you the marrow, the real uh, drawing out, the real burrowing in for the nuances of the Word of God and the, uh, the what's the word, the tremulous things that, that God can hint at uh, through his word even between the lines so to speak well what I'm going to share with you now is not that these are basic observations in chapter 14 verse 15 if you love me you will keep my commandments now I heard that so long that I kind of was numbed my way through the love part and didn't realize that the keeping of the commandments is not uh, a kind of act of human diligence it's the response of love God has so stacked things in his genius and his infinite wisdom that obedience is impossible independent of a loving relationship. He's not going to allow us to become technicians or to move ahead in religious zeal, which was the kind of thing of which I was, I've been guilty for so long and have impressed the saints in that condition. And yet you can obey, but I think that the quality of the obedience and the fruitfulness that will issue from it will be less if your obedience is out of conscience, out of religious requirement, rather than out of love. So God in his brilliance has rooted everything in the issue of the relationship with him in love, which beats the law, it beats legalism, it beats orthodoxy, it beats everything. But uh, to find that relationship, to nurture it, to maintain, to go on, to to deepen it is, is the thing in uh, verse 23 of that same chapter if a man loves me he will keep my word here again the conjunction between love and obedience is uh, reiterated and my father will love him he will come to him and make our home with him he who does not love me does not keep my words there's the long and the short of it that if there's a failure of obedience we, need, we just simply have to recognize the failure is the failure of love. We don't love him adequately. Or our obedience uh, would show it. 
And uh, I think you can make a case that this has always been so. This is not just a New Testament doctrine. This has always been the genius of God with men. So, for example, the Lord did not come to Israel till Sinai. But what preceded Sinai? It was the great deliverance out of Egyptian bondage and through the Red Sea that parted at the demonstration of the mighty power of God who brought them out by the blood of the Lamb and then assembled them at the base of Sinai and, and brought to them the law that they should obey it out of the love that grows from gratitude for so great a deliverance and so great a salvation which is exactly true of us if we don't love him enough remember what he said to that Pharisee into whose home a woman came uh, a street prostitute where the, where the guy murmured and he said if this man were a prophet he would know who, what kind of woman this is but what did this woman do despite the uh, the humiliation uh, of, uh, of coming into a men's fellowship in that culture and time and without saying the word breaking an expensive alabaster ba uh, uh, box and pouring the the content of this precious ointment upon the feet of Jesus and, and weeping over his feet, wiping them with her hair. And Jesus said, said to this guy who was murmuring under his breath, and even Jesus' disciples were murmuring, uh, this money might have gone to, uh, to buy literature or to help the poor. What a waste! But it was the extravagance of love by a woman who had heard the message or recognized in Jesus her salvation and the gratitude uh, eventuated in, issued in such a love that it was expressed in extravagance and maybe we need to say tonight that the love that does not express itself in arrogance is not love if it could be measured by the symbols symbolfuls if we uh, are mean about it or chintzy and uh, feel that if we put a dollar in a collection plate or if our church attendance has been regular, that what more can God ask? We have not experienced what that prostitute experienced, namely a gratitude for so great a salvation that lavishes upon Jesus and upon his body, the body of Christ, um, things that would make us poor. If a man loves me, he will keep my word. I think the first time that I really broke before God as a young believer was when I, at a certain full gospel breakfast in Kansas City where I was a young missionary to the Jews. The speaker said, when I was a younger believer, he said, I rushed to do the commandments of God. I was obedient to every commandment that the Lord showed me. But he said, as I have gone on in the faith, I no longer wait for the commandments. That's kid stuff. You have no, no alternative when God commands but to do. He said, now I intimate his will. I, I intimate the very disposition of his spirit and I rush to do it even before he commands it. You know where I was before the last word came out of his mouth? I was on the floor and under the table coming apart at the seams because I had probably um, complimented myself for my diligence in obeying but to intimate the will of God not to have to wait to be commanded is such an expression of a love that just uh, fastens uh, uh, on him and delights to do his will even before he speaks it can you imagine a church like that the whole house will be filled with the fragrance and on the occasions when I've preached this this broken alabaster box which my wife thinks is my greatest message and probably is I say we have been correct we've been charismatic we've learned all the principles we know how but our house is not filled with the fragrance and uh, in 2nd Corinthians I think the fourth chapter says and and by him that the triumph his triumph is made manifest by us in every place the knowledge of him the fragrance of him is made manifest by us in every place. You imagine wafting the fragrance of Christ in the office or in the seminary, in the classrooms, in the shopping mall or with our neighbors in our own families because of something that exudes out of our very life that is broken and that wants to heap upon the Lord the expensiveness of the inward thing that has been mined in us. 
If a man loves me, he will keep my word. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. At the very end of that chapter, verse 31, but uh, he says, the, the, verse 30, the rule of this world is coming, but he has no power over me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go hence. I know I'm taking great, great liberty, and my professors would cut me down in a moment to say that rise and, and, uh, and let us go hence is anything other than a directive for physical walking. But I want to be very suggestive tonight and say, rise, let us go hence. Let us do as Jesus did, who did as the Father commanded him, so that the world might know that I love the Father. Even his obedience to the Father was not some grisly compliance to a taskmaster. It was born out of love for the Father. And it's a, an obedience that took him all the way to the cross. As only loving obedience can. Because I think that principled obedience, or guilt-ridden obedience, or religious obedience, will break down somewhere before that place. Only the obedience of love will bring us all the way through as it brought him. Let us go hence. So, and again, even to abide in his love and to increase in his love is to keep his commandments as we're uh, told in verse 10 of chapter 15. And then in uh, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And not only is it the issue of uh, obedience, it's even the issue of faith, as chapter 16 indicates in verse 27. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I have come from the Father. I don't think that that believing was some kind of logical deduction with the data of, uh, that was presented by Jesus, some kind of bookkeeping acknowledgement, yes, that you must be the Christ because look, that, 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 this, 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 this is fulfilled. I think it's a love that made believing possible. It's a love that opened the floodgate of credulity and, and dissolved away the stubborn, human, uh, resistant unbelief. So even here, love is the key to believing as it's the, as the key to obeying. And so if you have trouble with faith and you don't know why you can't believe and, and why you're nervous or anxious in your faith and you don't have the quality of faith, maybe again. Uh, it's not that you have not been rubbing the genie lamp and invoking the promises uh, meticulously in order to obtain the, uh, something by a formula, but that the issue is much deeper, that the failure of faith is the failure of love. Everything points us back to the intimate, personal relationship with him. And with that as a preliminary, I want to take you to my real text for, the tonight, in, for tonight in the Old Testament, a very precious and favorite text, Exodus, the 24th chapter. And this is the chapter that describes how the law was obtained and given to Moses. I, I, I never cease to start to be awed at the terseness of the scripture, how compressed, how... Uh, so much can be said in so few words how God doesn't wallow in uh, redundant and unnecessary things very sparse, very lean they crucified him Jesus wept and here in, uh, in a few verses such an episode of this great man Moses being summoned by God to the top of the mount and there to receive the tablets of the law which is to be the basis for the whole obedience of the people of Israel to their God and the key to their witness to the nations. So in verse 24 we read, And he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship afar off. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings 
and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. Tragically, we know that wasn't so. There was a failure of love. They went whoring after other gods. They were unfaithful. They looked for some voluptuous alternative to the God who met them at the mount. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, who were the sons of Aaron and seventy of the elders of Israel, went up. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. I think it was the first communion between God and a people. And then here's our text. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tables of stone with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his servant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Tarry there, tarry here for us, until we come to you again. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a cause, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Amen. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me and be there, and I will. And I want to say that I believe with all my heart that that is the quintessential, definitive, apostolic requirement. You say, what are you talking about? Uh, the word apostle was not even yet invented in the time of Moses. But I see Moses as a foundational servant, a master builder. And he, all of the configuration of the things that, that make up that which is apostolic pertain to him. And so this call is critical. It is the key. It's the, it's the difference between the false and the true apostle. The false apostle is one who can market the principles one who is glib and facile in, in uh, interpolating uh, segments of the apostolic scriptures and applying them to a present church need, or having even some facility to help churches in their need or in their crises and, and be an older, uh, responsible brother, or even establish churches uh, in the uh, franchise McDonald's way. What's the difference between the true apostle and the false? It's not goodness, it's not facility with apostolic phraseology or an ability to do something for fellowships or to seem authoritative. The difference is the man who has gone up and the man who has not. The man who has remained below and thinks to serve God and his people without having made this ascent. And I want to bring you into remembrance that 12 or 13 weeks ago when all this began, without any collaboration on my part, because at that time I didn't even yet myself know uh, how the Lord was going to fill these weeks. And I have not known except week by week uh, of the day of the actual ministry to receive that word. But do you remember what happened that Sunday? There was a mountain made in the sanctuary, and the pastor and his wife wore uh, uh, hi uh, mountain hiking boots and short pants, lederhosen, and the whole motif was going up the mountain. And that was the kickoff for these weeks. And how does the, the, the God who is the Alpha uh, begin? How does he end as the Omega? By giving me the text today and come up into the mount and come up unto me in the mount and be there. You say, oh, what's so apostolic about that? Everything. 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 It may say in your text, as it does in mine, come up and wait there. But the King James and other versions read, 
come up and be there. And I want to say tonight for your discerning hearing that the world is dying for the want of proper being. You shall be witnesses unto me. And we have misread that to think it means and you shall do witnessing for me. Everything issues out of being. True ministry, true witness is out of being, not out of doing. Doing is the, is the very thing from which God wants to deliver us. It's too, too Judaistic, too, too legalistic, too outward. It's being. Come up unto me and be there. And I will give you the tablets of the law which I have written. And I think King James says that, that thou mayest teach them. It doesn't mean that God's up there as some kind of expedient provider. That, uh, well, we have to make one last descent, however arduous, to get the thing that will enable us to perform our ministry. And I'm taking pains to elaborate that because I know you. I know me. I know us. We're American. We're modern. We're impatient. We're expedient. We're utilitarian. We'll do just that minimal thing that is required to obtain that which serves our ends even religiously and even spiritually speaking. But the woman with the alabaster box went far beyond expedience. And, and as we have been willing to be only merely expedient with God, how then have we re been related with each other? No wonder that we don't often hear confessions of men publicly that their marriages are askew and, and, and appealing for the prayer of the saints. I said to Arlene Hatchin before I left the house tonight, if the handful of souls who will come out tonight will come under the burden of this need in my own marriage and we would agree together in that holy place, I'll, I'll get a phone call by the time I get home with the wife saying, come. Every depressing spirit, every discouraging spirit, everything that has robbed her of hope and faith for the future or for the continuance of this relationship will be dismissed when something is broken in the heavenlies by a people who are together who can go beyond merely the expedient and the necessary thing. The fragrance is going to have to fill the house again. It's not just come up and be there and then you'll get. It's come up unto me. Come up unto me. I'm the end in myself. I'm not just a means to an end. I didn't just save you that you should be delivered out of this and that uh, a thing uh, and that you should be equipped to do this or that. The whole purpose is to come unto me for my own sake without any thought of the consequence or what will be the result or the reward or the benefit. So long as that tinctures our thought about relationship with God, we have not ascended this mount. This mount is the mount of the negation of all expediency. It's come up unto me and be there alone for my own sake. Be there. And you know, if we really search our hearts, when is the last time we have really been anywhere in that kind of totality? Even when we're talking with one another, I know what I'm guilty of, my mind is already racing and I'm thinking of something for tomorrow or I, I can't even wait for the person to finish. I'm ready to answer them before they've gotten their question out or their statement. As if the issue is giving them an answer. You know what I've learned in community? And the many crises and problems that we've had to experience? All of us, it began to dawn on me over the years, the frequency of these crises and insuperably difficult problems. That the reason that God was giving them to us was not that we should seek a solution, but that we should seek Him. Because He knows our sloth. He knows that we've been calibrated and inducted into the mentality of the world that we only go so far as is necessary to obtain our end. And as soon as that thing comes in sight, that's the end of our seeking Him. And what is an apostle in the last analysis? Why is he foundational to the church? Why is the church built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? Because they're clever? Because they're glib? Because they have a command of the principles of the scripture? And I'm not negating those things, but something more. Because they communicate very God. 
Because you tell me, what is a church that is built on correct principles and has correct procedure and correct church order and divine government and every other requisite thing and has not the sense of God? It's a husk. It's a caricature. My God, give me some sloppy, uh, slapdash, out of joint, broken, awkward, groping bundle of saints who don't even know what divine order is, who yet have something palpitating. There's yet a fragrance. There's the sense of God. Because the world is dying for the sense of God. Who He is that cannot be communicated by principle. It's the fragrance of Him that is to be made manifest in every place. Not the principles about Him. But where is that to be obtained? Only in one place. Come up to me and be there. What an ascent. And you think it's just a cutesy little hike and you'll get there without hardly being winded, you're mistaken. I can tell you by the time you get there, that my experience in community and in fact my whole 22 year walk and my own present struggles are any indication of what it is to which God is leading us tortuously through such paths that except your eye is fixed on Him, you can't even find your way to the top. It's wreathed in smoke. At the time you get there, you're bloody. You're dripping. Your, your, your flesh has had burrs and briars embedded. You've twisted your ankle. You've stubbed your feet. You've, you've sweated and you've, you're, you're just a, a, a mess of, of sweat and blood and dirt and groping with your fingers and clamoring. And every single thing that is strident and logical is, is wooing you to come down. Don't be a fool. It's a, it's a vain exertion. To defy gravity like that and to go up. Three times in the year, the men of Israel were required to go up to Jerusalem. Of all places to locate uh, the house of God and the holiest place of all, where the obedience to God was to be given, it had to go up to Jerusalem. There's always a going up. And we've lost sight of that. We've lost sense of that. With automatic drive and, and, and turbo uh, power and all that kinds of things that that a little touch of the toe, zoom. Hey, this is going to cost something, guys, to go up this mountain. It's going to cost something psychologically, spiritually, physically, morally. And you're all alone. And everything else is below, with all of the clamoring details and the weight of them and the things that need to be attended, that you never are able to get free from it. Did I tell you about the time when I was preaching and, and I said that the church was born in waiting? in the upper room and that it needs to continue in the spirit of waiting and waiting is the priestly disposition that has been lost to our modern sensibility and some young kid just newly saved came to me after the service and said uh, Mr. Kess he said uh, in all of your travels around the world he said have you ever found a fellowship uh, that has waited 10 days on the Lord like, like the early church I went gulp and my mind raced through these brilliant fellowships where have I not been the biggest the best finest the most touted and lauded and I had to think, no, I don't, I don't know of one where an entire fellowship, as it was uh, in the days preceding Pentecost, waited on the Lord together. Waiting is going up. Waiting is sacrifice. Waiting is dying. What do you do? You, you, you twiddle your thumbs? What about the boredom? We, we need distraction. We're sensual. We need something voluptuous for our seeing, for our hearing. We're full of mind lust. We need new ideas, something novel, something... Well, what do we do for ten days with the same saints locked into one place? And after the young man asked me if I'd known a fellowship, then the Lord took over and he said, Okay, Hotshot, how about your fellowship? How about your community that has opted to go up into the woods and into the rugged and the remote parts to find its way back into the apostolic lifestyle? When are you going to wait ten days in the Lord? I was doubled over, hit in the solar plexus. The wind went out of me. And I came back to whisper to the fellowship, you know what the Lord said to me? Hey, that's great art. One day we'll do that. When it's convenient. 
when the kids don't have to go to school, when, the, when there's no great demand on ministry, when the phone is not ringing, when I have this need. You know, what, as soon as the, the... You know what we found? That time never comes. The world is never accommodating. And even the religious world uh, fills you with so much consternation and go and do. You know what we had to do? The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violence take it by force. We declared, the elders, beginning Monday, we're commencing a 10-day period of waiting on the Lord. We're stopping everything, everything. No cooking, fasting, 10 days. No program, no, no business, no detail. We're going to wait on the Lord. We didn't know how to do it. And we elders are going to begin first. And so we started in about a three, third or fourth hour, we were dozing off. <laughs> right, the Lord is, you know, full of love, full of patience. He knows our frames. And he showed us how to do it. Three-hour shifts around the clock, 24 hours a day. Unceasing prayer. Uh, and so you rotated. And uh, you find yourself in a prayer shift from four to seven in the morning with saints with whom you've never prayed before, that you've been in fellowship with them ten years. And on the seventh day of the fast, when your breath smells like a camel, <laughs> and you've long since ceased being able to pray spiritually, or even significantly, or even intelligently, and your prayer now is just a, uh, a groan. I remember myself in that condition, on the floor, founder of the community. On the floor, with two or three of the other saints, in the same kind of whacked out condition, too feeble even to raise our voices. And it was holy. It was precious. It was revelational. You say, Art, when the ten days were over, did the fire of God fall? Don't think we didn't need it. <laughs> but it didn't. You know why? Because if we had even surreptitiously in our own minds calculated, hey, listen, we're investing ten days of fasting and prayer around the clock we'll get our reward. We'll get the fire of God to fall. We would have invalidated the whole meaning of the word waiting. The moment that you establish a condition or look for a reward or a response for your investment, it's no longer priestly. It's no longer waiting. It's no longer going up. It's an experience. Expediency is a means to an end. Even if it's a spiritual end, it stinks. Because there's a God who is still waiting for the fundamental apostolic requirement. Come up unto me and be there. Just for my own sake. Don't worry wonder what the benefit will be to you. Or how it will enhance your ministry. Or what greater anointing you're now going to have. Or insight or revelation. Or to be able to boast. I have been in the very presence of the Most High. I'll tell you, when the 40 days of getting up there, just like the 10 days of fasting and prayer around the clock, you don't have any motives anymore. You know what I, you know what I realized when I stretched out and it's just a piece of hulk? One thing I realized was, in all the years that we've been together in community, we've had three-day fast, five-day fast for critical decisions about overseas trips and urgent matters. We had never really adequately sought the Lord. We put in what we thought was the modicum required to obtain the end, namely the revelation of his will, should we, shouldn't we. But we had never really sought him. And when I was in that condition, in those wee hours, you know, I realized he is the creator and I am the creature. And in this prostration before him, with, with my tongue cleaving to the roof of my mouth, dry and unable even to beep anything that it was faintly spiritual, I am in my proper place before him. Now I have a sense of who he is as I sense who I am properly. And this sense of God is everything. To restore this sense is the apostolic requirement for what shall we communicate if we don't have it? But if we make it a means to having it, we'll never have it. It's just simply a love of God that beckons us, come up unto me and be there. 
your mind, your soul, your thoughts, your emotions, all that you are, the totality of all that you are, come before me as the total God that I am. And let totality meet totality, because that's what the faith is all about. That deliverance, that healing, that salvation. And once we find it with him, I think we're going to be another people with each other. We're not going to be doing it by the numbers, like those paint sets, you know. 17 is purple and 12 is red. And when, you're all, when it's all finished, it's, it's Lean Out of Da Vinci's Last Supper. It's not going to be like that. There's going to be a transformation in proportion to the fact that we have come up unto him and been there. I think we're going to be to each other something new, something else, something far more attentive, something far more patient. Uh, I had the privilege of being counseled by John Sanford, and the Inga came at the end of it. I spent two weeks with this precious man in his basement, and... Um, when Inga came, we finally sat down together and he gave me my report card. I only got a C. And I thought I was doing real well. I didn't blow my cool and I was rather calm and gallant. And uh, he said, Artie said, you were responding to Inga outwardly and literally as if what she was saying is really what she means. I said, huh? <laughs> He said, you did not at all relate to what she was really saying, to what she really is. That's, that's what a, a dum-dum I am. Because I don't know how to be there. If I've not found it with God, how shall I find it with my wife or with men? To enjoy the saints, to appreciate each other, even when we're not amusing, even when we're not clever even when we don't have some great insight or revelation, just to enjoy the presence, just to be together. We don't have to say anything weighty. Be there is everything. And for the want of that ability, an entire modern civilization is going awry. They're flipping out, they're freaking out. They're, 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 they're driven to find some novelty, some new alternative, some clever thing, some orgy, some drug that they've never tried before, some new fetish, any kind of thing to break their science. They're, they're, they're driven because they've never known how to be there. And there's never been a church to show them. Because we're marked by our own restlessness and by our own drivenness. We've not been there and been called up into his presence on the seventh day. And I want to say it's more than just going up, however great that is. And turning a deaf ear to everything that says, stay down here. And some of you have already experienced that. You're becoming fanatical. Uh, what's the matter with your uh, religion as we've known it? You'll hear worse things than that. There's something that infuriates even the religious world by those who begin the ascent. Maybe some of us have begun it and were discouraged and turned back and came down below where the others are and have gone on in a lackadaisical and nondescript Christianity because we didn't persevere to the top. If I would say anything about these 12 weeks of speaking, the sum total of them has been a call to come up unto me and be there. <clears throat> Moses did not eat nor drink and it says the cloud covered the mountain verse 15 the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud no accident that six is the number of man seven is the number of divine rest where we cease from our own doing but for six days he had to stay in this mountain wreathed with smoke. And I want you to know that that was not marshmallows or cotton candy or something that you fly through that, that is white and, and fluffy. This was a frightening, thick smoke of the fire of God's presence. Six days in it will extinguish anything in you that is humanly religious. 
So how do you know art? Well, because I had six minutes in thick smoke that has revolutionized my believing life. Up, up at the community, the building caught fire where we were staying one night, about three or four in the morning. We heard the crackling and smelled the smoke, and we got out in time with the best building we had. And my wife was beside herself. She said, you go in and get my pocketbook. It's right on top of the kitchen counter. Man, I knew that kitchen like the palm of my hand. We had our meetings in the living room. I've been in and out of that place countless times. Sure, there's no problem. I bent my head low. I went in through the front door. And, and that kitchen counter could not have been more than the distance between me and, and the first row here. The moment I entered into that smoke, not only could I not find the counter, I could not find the door through which I just entered. I was completely and totally, humanly, what's the word, disoriented. I lost every bearing. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you where I was, how to come in or to go out. It was an absolutely stupefying experience for a man that has lived for over 50 years by his wit, by his intelligence, by his ability, by his command, by his knowledge, to be totally disoriented that there's nothing to which one can turn in himself or outwardly for guidance, for direction, when you're in a precarious and even a dangerous situation. I never did get her purse. I never found the kitchen counter. And only by the grace of God did I find the door to get out again. Thick smoke. Moses was in it for six days. And of course, this was a prince in Egypt. This was a man who was tutored and uh, skilled in all of Egyptian law and, and uh, metaphysics and, and, and mathematics and whatever their, uh, their civilization offered. And he wasn't altogether uh, uninstructed in the things pertaining to the God of Israel. And to be in that smoke for six days means a total emptying. You don't come before this God in that presence with your charismatic know-how, with your brittle cleverness and your formulas and uh, how to do it. We know, but we don't know as we ought to know. And we'll never ascend that mount if we're, correct, if we're content merely to be correct. There's something beyond being correct. There's something beyond uh, truth. There's truth and truth, if I can put it that way. There's truth that has come to us by listening to tapes, uh, by reading books, and there's truth that has come to us that comes to us out of the presence of God that is ultimate truth. That is real knowing. And that's why my prayer has been every week, Lord, let me not stand before this people except that I can speak to them as one having come out of your presence. I want to ask you, not only are you willing for the rigors and the ardor of going up and turning the deaf ear to everything that will keep you below, but are you willing also to enter into something that contains the number six by which you will be emptied of your humanity and everything that has been humanly obtained? Are you willing to come before God as a boob, as not knowing, as without your own cleverness, without your own artfulness, without your ability to put fellowships together and teach this or that or witness or all the things in which we think that we have uh, know-how and comprehension and to receive from him out of his presence the tablet that he has written. That's what I think this suggests. And I've tasted this, sm this smoke a little bit. I know the humiliation of what it means to be a missionary to the Jews and not have a single message on prophecy in Israel the only one in the whole mission board. How come on? Don't you have a concordance? Sure, I got a concordance. But I'm not going to cleverly make up a message, however correct it is, about Israel and prophecy. I'll only preach it in the day that the Lord gives it by revelation out of His presence. Then you have a word. Then you have an understanding. Then you have a knowledge. And maybe what we can say about our charismatic generation, that, that, that that's exactly what we've not done. We've established systems, discipleship, and we've had orders and hierarchical pyramidal structures of who's related to who, and we've taken precious and divine ways of God and transmuted it into some kind of human claptrap system that victimizes rather than ennobles and uplifts, because you can't take the holy things and transpose them. 
We need to receive them out of the presence of God when we have come up to Him and been there. Then we can come down the mountain. Then we have something to offer that's not plastic, but written with the finger of God upon His own tablets. Then we can find Israel going amok and dancing nakedly around the golden calf, too impatient to wait. As for that man, Moses, and finding its own substitute, charismatic alternatives that seem like the real thing and sound like the real thing but are false and to come down and to dash the tablets in divine anger what? isn't Moses the meekest of all men? I'll tell you what there's a conjunction between divine anger and divine meekness only the divinely meek can uh, express the wrath of God not a matter of temperament or personal uh, uh, irritation and where did he obtain that meekness? He was fused to the God who is very humility itself in the fire on top of the mountain. He saw the glory of God. He was in the presence of God. And that, if that will not establish meekness in the soul of a man, I don't know what else will. You'll never learn it as a principle. Only out of union with him who is meek and says, learn of me who am lonely and meek of heart. And here where he was expressing the hot indignation of a man who's meek. And he ground that golden calf to powder and tossed it in the drink and made them lap it up. And you don't hear so much as a whimper. The same Israel, who is this Moses? And that was continually bucking against him and railing against him and revolting. You don't hear a whimper of opposition. Who are you to require this? Because he who was meek and was indignant was also authoritative. And it wasn't an authority that was tied to his office. It was tied to his person. It was infused in his being because he brought the very sense and presence and authority of the God in whose presence he had stood in that seventh and final day. That's the basis for authority. Not human expertise or cleverness or our credentials or what school we've graduated or our experience, but the sense of God that, that has been obtained in communion with him. Any other authority that is braggadocio, bravado, it's false. The false apostles and the false prophets are those who have never ascended up. Willing to go? And Moses entered the cloud and went up. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So I'm getting my signals that my time is out. And I gave you an invitation last week to enter within the veil. I'm giving you an invitation this week to ascend up to the mount. And really, it's saying essentially the same thing. Come up unto me and be there. And I will give you the tables of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction that thou mayest teach them. It will be another kind of teaching. It's not going to be some glib, unctuous performance not going to be a clever guy doing the right thing. It's going to be communicating not just the law, but the law giver, because you bear the very sense of him having come from his, from his presence. That's apostolic. That's the, the ingredient and the quality for which the church is perishing, and what shall we say of the world? Freaking out from novelty, diversion, distraction, entertainment, because it, this glory has not been communicated by men who have come up. So let's say yes to the Lord. If the coming up means a trial in marriage, physical difficulty, whatever kind of emptying, whatever breaking from earthly things that God is about, if you've heard his voice in these weeks and these, and these nights, come. It's, it's something that no man can presume to do without being invited. But once you ascend, go all the way. Precious God, Jesus, may we hear your voice tonight, my God. May we hear threaded throughout all of the speaking what you're saying to us it's not a Bible teaching. It's an invitation. Come up 
unto me and be there. We ask your forgiveness, Lord, for our distraction, for our partial coming, for our inadequate uh, union and relationship, Lord, for our expedient uh, mentality. We're only willing to give, my God, what is needful to obtain what we think is required. Teach us what totality means. Teach us, teach us what it means to come up and to be there before the God who is total. Pure actuality, to be there in our minds, our hearts, and all that we are, to be there for your sake, and not for something that, will be, that we will obtain by coming. For you are, precious God, the end-all and the be-all. You're the thing in itself. You're the precious source. You're all in all, Lord. Bid us come. Help us to make this ascent. Bring us into that precious union, willing to be emptied, my God, of our own notions, however correct, that we might receive from you, out of your presence, the thing that is burningly true. That we might receive, my God, authority, meekness, all that's required in the coming into the land. We bless you and we thank you and we say yes to you, Lord, and we come. For Jesus' sake, in his name, amen. Bless the Lord. Well, I appreciate the, the elders and whoever else wants to come up and pray. And we, The first message was Acts 13, so they laid hands upon them and so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost went and I pray that this is going to be a Holy Ghost sending and will not be human cleverness that will be coming to men but something out of the heart of God to men who are living in a very critical place.